I knew they were going to ask me to write about writing short, and 10 minutes is really hard for me, so just punch me <laughs> if I need to. I have a lot to say. Um, so I first became aware of voice when I first became a reader myself. You know, you hear your parents read to you, and they, if they're good readers and they're good parents, they make up all kind of voices, and you're not sure who the narrator is or versus Curious George versus the man in the yellow hat. But when I became a reader myself, and I loved reading stories ever since I was a little kid, the first voice that I ever noticed was the voice of a little girl told by an old man. My favorite book still in the whole wide world is Charlotte's Web. And I remember reading the beginning of that book, my favorite lead ever still in the history of the world, where's Papa going with that axe? <laughs> Those words, what is it, six words? You know so much about the voice of that narrator and that character. It's got to be a little kid. Papa tells me it's got to be somebody like on a farm or something kind of rural. My dad was daddy. My da father's dad was father. This is Papa. And where's he going with that axe? I mean, there's fright, there's wonder, there's death, there's murder, there's blood. There's everything in that very first sentence. But it's a little girl. It's a seven-year-old girl, which is how old I was when I read that story, written by a 57-year-old man. And I just remember saying to my mother, how did that old man write that book? You know, it was just an amazing thing to me. So I, that's my first taste of voice. And ever since then, I've tried to figure out, how do you do that as a writer? How do you give that to your readers, where you become somebody that they can relate to so immediately, just from flat words on the page? And as a journalist especially, I think, you know, a lot of us grew up in the inverted pyramid style era, where the voice of the journalist was no voice at all. The voice of the journalist was invisible, it, or it was just, here's the information that you need to know. So when I became a college student, I was an English major. I wanted, I wanted to be a reporter, but I wanted to have a voice, and I wanted to learn how to write, and I didn't think journalism was going to do that for me. Um, so this has been always been very important to me. So I, I, when I got asked to do this, Butch asked me to do a session on voice, and I thought, oh my god, that's so hard to do, especially in 10 minutes. I put up a Facebook post, and I got 60-something Facebook posts right away about what's your favorite author and show me your favorite passage of writing that shows voice. 60 people within two hours. And there were like probably 20 new writers that I'd never heard of. Well, that night, I put another post up and I said, okay, how do you do that? <laughs> Crickets, right? I have like a thousand journalist friends on my Facebook. I got one response, get a good editor. <laughs> and I thought, all right, that's what everybody's dream is, like find this editor that's gonna help me find my voice, you know? But an editor's not gonna help you find your voice. There's nothing an editor can do other than help you hone your voice. You've got to find that voice yourself, and it takes a lot of work, and it never happens for little kids unless, uh, until they start getting taught how to write. You know, Little kids have great voices. There's teachers in here. You know they've got great voices in elementary school, and you get them to middle school, and they're like, oh, I have to do the FCAT formula. You know, I have these certain things they're going to check off. So the, I think the hardest part about finding your voice is shutting everything else out. I mean, you can see that by reading a whole lot and thinking about what works and what doesn't work. Songs, musicians, are a great way to find your voice because their voices are so strong. But the thing you have to do most, I think, as a writer, and I think the thing that's hardest, especially for reporters growing up in the digital age, is to shut up and turn off the noise and find your own voice. It's like with that Pink Floyd song, the lunatic is in your head, right? Your voice is in your head. It's somewhere in there. You've got to just shut the other stuff off to find it. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what voice is, why it's important, and um, what you guys might be able to do to carve your own voices out a little bit more. This is a, a wonderful writer named Connie Hale. Voice separates brochures and brilliance. Memo and memoir. Oops, I went the wrong way. A ship's log and the old man in the sea. The best writers stamp prose with their own distinctive personality. Their timbre and tone are as recognizable as the voices on the phone. And that's the challenge, right? To me, that is the challenge. You want to be able to come up with a voice that's your own, that's distinctive. I love it when someone goes, oh my god, I read this story in the paper and I knew it was Elaine DeGregory story. And the first part of me is like, yay, they recognize my writing, that's awesome. And then the second thought is like, oh shit, do all my stories sound the same? <laughs> am I getting in that rut where they know who I am because it's all repetitive? And I remember when I came to the Tampa Bay Times, the St. Pete Times, I came because of Tom French, because he was the most wonderful writer and inspirational teacher I'd ever seen. And do you remember we were working on a story about after the mixed up elections, I moved to right after those Chad elections. And Tom said, we're going to write a story about a series about ordinary people and how they react to this mixed up election. But I want it to be, do you remember what you told me? The White Album. He goes, I want you to do the White Album. Every song on there is distinctive and individualistic, but every song on there is definitely the Beatles. And to me, 
There's no other rock group in the world that has different sounds, but yet you always know it's the Beatles. I mean, you go from I want to hold your hand to I am the walrus, and it's the same guy who wrote it. Like, how would you ever be able to believe that was the same band? But you know. And so that, to me, is the ultimate type of voice. When you can find a voice that's distinctively yours, but also different, and it can change and shift depending on what your subject matter is. Dolly Parton, one of my favorite singer-songwriters. This is the best quote I found about voice. I went all through the thesaurus looking for voice quotes for this, you guys. And the best one I found was on the back of a Dolly Parton album. Figure out who you are. That's the hardest part, right? To find your voice, you gotta know who you are and what you wanna tell, and then do it on purpose. That's when you get to really start working at it. Okay, so I did a master's thesis on uh, USA Today when it was just coming out as a new newspaper. And I did a bunch of research about they were trying to make a prototype of it, what was it going to look like. And they were, the editor was trying to, Newhouse was trying to explain how they're going to be different from the other national newspapers. And I just think this is a great example of voice. What do you want your publication to say? Because the voice of the publication is important, right? I mean, the writer's voice is really important, but if I'm writing a story for, about medical marijuana, and I'm writing it for you know, the St. Petersburg Times versus High Times versus Rolling Stone, it's going to have a really different voice depending on what publication you're writing for. So part of your voice has to be dictated by what your publication is. And I just love these examples. The Wall Street Journal is going to be all about the stock exchange halting when the world ends. The New York Times hits the third world hardest. Washington Post, world ends may affect elections, sources say. <laughs> and then USA Today was the first national newspaper to use we. We as a voice for their paper. They wanted to be the voice of the United States readers. We're gone. State by state demise on 6A, final scores on 8C, you know. And it's just, it totally encapsulated what they wanted that publication to do. Um, there's also a difference in perspective in terms of where you are reporting this story. One of the biggest stories we had in the past few years here was this Gulf oil spill. And the Associated Press, of course, always has the very first story out on the wire. A Florida, it's very Associated Press, right? A Florida beach was closed to visitors for the first time because of the Gulf oil spill Thursday. Workers try to remove the pool as a black sledge. All right, very newsy. What you need to know, people of the world, this is what you need to know. Pensacola, local, very hyper-local, little tiny paper. The sign at Pensacola Beach property is boasted, always has been, always will be, the most beautiful beaches in the world, not on Wednesday. That is, that is hyper-local. That's someone who grew up there, who watched that sign as they grew up and went, oh, holy cow, our way of life is coming to an end. And then this one is my favorite not just because I sit by my wonderful colleague, Ben Montgomery, but he totally captured with this authoritative voice what this was like for people to expe experience. Do you want to read it, Ben? <laughs> the tide came in Tuesday night under a moon almost full, and when the sun came up and the water retreated, there it was. A broken band of oil about five feet wide and eight miles long. It looked like tobacco spit and smelled foreign, and it pooled in yesterday's footprints as far as you could see. State officials called it the worst show of crude on shore from the gusher 120 miles away. That's voice, right? That, that to me shows someone who understood and owned this. All right, I'm going to go really quick through here. You guys can read these because I'm running out of time. But So once you get past the voice of your publication, you have to try voices of perspective. First person, to me, is probably the easiest to get into and the worst to get out of. And it's the worst if you fail at it. You are vulnerable when you use first person. But this person, nobody could have written this story except for Howl Rains. There's no way anybody could have gotten in there and owned that without living it themselves. Second person is, I think, the very hardest to do, but often the most effective. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have read this wonderful story from ESPN Magazine. I understand the writer originally wrote it in third person and then changed it. It's about a paralyzed football player from Rutgers who had to move back in and live with his mom. And the beginning of this is probably the most amazing beginning I've read in years. You can feel your nose itching and not be able to itch it because he gets so well in this guy's head. It's your nose this time. You try to do for alone sitting in your bedroom. And then the end, it goes, ma. He has to call his mother to scratch his nose. You know, but this makes the readers feel like they're that guy. And then this is something my son and I were talking about. He's an aspiring actor. And how the, the biggest privilege and also the biggest um, pitfall you can come into as an actor is trying to live somebody else's life. Heath Ledger died over that it, it, tension. But I think we do the same thing as journalists, right? We inhabit other people's lives. We inhabit their worlds. And the easiest way for me to find a voice is to adopt somebody else's voice. So I try to be, get in the head of the person that I'm writing about. And this was a story about a mentally ill man who was getting his first job, his first paycheck. 
and I reported all of this and, and observed it, but I wanted to be inside his head. What was it like to be so scared of how people were going to judge you for making sandwiches too slow? Voice of authority. That's the voice I think people think of when they think of the voice of a writer. It's, it's the John McPhee, it's the Ernest Hemingway, it's the I own this material like nobody else can own it. I'm not very good at that voice, but a lot of the best writers who you think of as writers with voice do that. Um, this is my old and favorite editor, Mike Wilson, writing about a baseball coach. He's the game. I mean, there's nothing more authoritative than that to start out with. Um, do I have, I'm done? Okay, I'm done, I'm done. Wait, uh, here's the blocks to, to voice. Okay, one thing I'll tell you really quickly is just turn off everything when you're writing. That's how you find your voice. Turn off your Facebook, turn off your music, turn off everything, and get inside your head. Thank you. <laughs>